So there's a magic card, Oblivion Ring. When it enters the battlefield, it exiles something, removing another card from the game. And then, when it leaves the battlefield, it gives the card back. Really simple, it falls under the blanket category of removal, or cards that don't give you good things so much as take good things away from your opponent. Oblivion Ring is very versatile removal, able to get rid of basically anything, but unlike most removal, it allows your opponent a chance to get their stuff back. Super fair, really straightforward, and as a result, largely unremarkable. But there's a particular interaction between the card's text and the rules of the game that changes this. I'll try to keep from getting too deep in the weeds, but basically, if you can make Oblivion Ring leave the battlefield as soon as it enters it, you can trigger its abilities in reverse. It gives your opponent their stuff back, then takes it away. And since you've already gotten rid of Oblivion Ring, there's no Oblivion Ring for your opponent to destroy. So what you take is gone forever, irretrievably lost to a technicality. The card was not intended to work like this, but because of its precise wording, and how that wording relates to decades of rules and rulings, and a desire for those rules and rulings to create a consistent set of principles on how the game is played, the card does work like this. Using Oblivion Ring in this manner isn't cheating, in fact it's displaying a deep understanding of the rules, but it is taking advantage of an accidental interaction. And while I really do like weird interactions like this, aspects of the game that emerge not from the deliberate hand of the devs, but from the complexities of the design itself coming to life like burgeoning AI, this use of Oblivion Ring has always struck me as kinda spooky. See. Most removal spells pretty unambiguously destroy their targets. Incinerate incinerates them, terminate terminates them, eaten by spiders, well, you get the idea. These are all pretty unpleasant things to have happen to someone, but the sense is, once they're done, the target of their wrath isn't really around to suffer anymore. But Oblivion Ring is more of a prison than a hungry spider. The art shows a guy fully conscious as the ring restrains him. And so, if the person I've exiled with Oblivion Ring is still, within the fiction of the game, awake, then they're awake when I've taken advantage of the ruling and cast them forever into the void. A regular removal spell leaves its target dead and buried, but this Oblivion Ring exploit leaves them buried alive, screaming in vain as they drift through a blank infinity. Were Magic a video game, this interaction would probably just be patched out. A central client means that any changes to the accepted wording of a card would apply to everyone's digital copy, informing them of the change and enforcing it all at once. But the nature of a physical card game means that once words have been printed, it is remarkably difficult to change those words. Wizards of the Coast can ban cards if they become problematically strong, and they've done periodic errata for largely unimportant stuff, like this guy, printed as a generic beast, but errata to be a pangolin, a distinction that makes absolutely no gameplay impact whatsoever. But neither of these things are appropriate for Oblivion Ring. For starters, this exploit isn't even all that strong, so banning the card would be silly, while an errata that changes the card's function and invalidates decks set up to take advantage of that function becomes a logistical nightmare to implement without a central client to do it for you. So while Oblivion Ring is not a problem card by any means, please don't ban or errata it, it does represent a unique challenge to tabletop games. Because card games are, essentially, just words, but words the players accept as absolute. To play magic is to agree to follow what each card says, exactly as it says it, whether you want to or not. When Terminate says it will destroy a creature, it has no mechanism of doing so beyond the compliance of the players. Its rules text becomes, and I'm so sorry for this, a kind of magic words. Words whose inscription makes them real, makes the world around them subservient to their reality. The game only works if the players have at least some consensus that the text of these cards must be followed, no matter what. And so, changing that text, and the reality that text holds up, shows how fragile the reality is. In a system built on the primacy of words, a system that derives its legitimacy from those words, a change to the words becomes a threat to the system itself. And so old laws reign supreme, even when they allow for horrible things, because to change them is to admit they were only ever words to begin with. I'm, uh, I'm not talking about magic cards anymore. The past few months in America have been especially horrific. 
The overturn of Roe v. Wade, mass shootings in Buffalo, Uvalde, and Highland Park, a rise in queerphobia, especially transphobia, and its overt viciousness and mainstream acceptance. These awful things are done by awful people, whether that's one man with an assault rifle or a whole political party built on crushing the already vulnerable underfoot. These horrors are the result of malice and greed and hatred, material conditions and political considerations. But they have all been held up by words. Old words. Terrible words. With gaps between them so abyssally wide as to swallow us whole. We have a legal system built on the principle of stare decisis. It's the basis for the concept of legal precedence, that future cases should be decided by past rulings. The idea behind this system is that it limits the authority of individual judges to do whatever they want and leads to a stable, consistent interpretation of the laws. I don't know anywhere near enough to argue the overall merits of this system, but its downsides are pretty apparent. Because any decision has the potential to become precedent, a bad decision can lead to a whole bunch more bad decisions for no other reason than that it's happened before. And while the goal of a stable, consistent legal system has some value, that value is undercut if the system was horse to begin with. For instance, the Depp Heard verdict was awful. In a civil suit about whether Amber Heard was false and malicious in alluding to domestic violence she faced, violence for which she provided substantial photographic and corroborating evidence, she was found libelous, owing damages to the man who beat her. But it gets an additional awful dimension as precedent, where now any discussion of abuse by powerful men can be financially ruinous to their targets, no matter how overwhelming the proof of that abuse. We already see Marilyn Manson adopting this tactic against Evan Rachel Wood, and other outed abusers are obviously paying attention. We can see, quite clearly, the ways this ruling will be exploited, but seeing it gives us no way to stop it. The words have been said, precedent has been set, and our reality follows. We see the same sort of concept and the same sort of results with the US Supreme Court and the Constitution. SCOTUS's most powerful legal tool is judicial review, the ability to strike something down as unconstitutional. And so we have a legal system deciding critical questions not out of principles, but out of deference to a 250-year-old document written by slave owners. We're in this Kafkaesque position where the law is defined not by justice or fairness or benefit or obligation, but by adherence to an old text. An ancient and broken thing whose brokenness ends and ruins lives, but that we have to contend with regardless. Like, the really vital question about gun control is how to do it while disarming cops, not making them the only people with guns. But so often the questions we're asked are how to reckon with the precise wording of the Second Amendment. And that wording, backed by death cults and arms dealers, holds more legal weight than any number of murdered children. Through all of this, the Democrats do little but offer procedural excuses for why there is nothing they can do. The filibuster, conventions on court size, the Senate parliamentarian. At the time of writing, Biden has started to consider executive actions that could defend abortion rights, but the vast majority of messaging from the DNC is, sorry, things are tough, but if we don't follow this obscure rule, we're no better than the other side. To be clear, I think this is a cynical answer from the Democratic leadership who, in deference to their mega-donors, don't want things to meaningfully change. But for the average liberal, such deference to words constrains the political imagination so thoroughly it starts to suffocate. Meanwhile, the other side has no respect for the words beyond the power that they offer. There's Frank Wilhoit's incisive quote coming from, hilariously, the comment section of a blog. Conservatism consists of exactly one proposition. There must be in-groups whom the law protects but does not bind, alongside out-groups whom the law binds but does not protect. For instance, the legal strategy to dismantle abortion rights has been essentially whatever they can get away with, but the end goal is draconian restriction on bodily autonomy to be enforced by the American police. Which, huh, looks like they've been in the news recently for some other reason. I'm sure it's something good. Taken together, we have a political reality that feels a lot like the Oblivion Ring exploit. Like a force that was designed not to create anything good, but to take the good away, is swallowing us whole. Like we have identified the source of the problem, but thrall to ancient and imperfect words, there is nothing we can do about it. 
Like our world is ruled by the dread, mad magic of the past replicating itself, by text that warps reality around it, and as we are dragged into that warp, awake and screaming, we are assured it is all going according to plan. But it is also within that oblivion that we can glimpse a way out. Because the words inscribed on Oblivion Ring are merely words, and our deference to them is, ultimately, voluntary. They are absolute in the game of magic, but only if we agree to play. And while the words of the law, the horrifying precedents, the amendments promising slavery and slaughter are uniquely American oblivion of codified injustice violently enforced by the state, they too are just words, just the rules to a silly game whose stakes are life and death. And as we see the Oblivion Ring trying to consume something good, see the terrible promise of its permanent removal, see the space between the words grow teeth and turn into a maw, we can say no. No, not these words, not this game. We're not going to play anymore.